Well, good morning again. I invite you to keep your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 6 as we look together at God's Word. I think it's uh, pretty safe to say that nobody expected 2020 to be anything remotely like what it's been. Like this has been one of the most dislocating experiences in recent memory with everything that we just kind of took for granted being brought to a grinding halt. Uh, things like going to work. Like who'd ever thought that would be hard to do? Or going to school, going to church, buying toilet paper, all of these things that are just normal life gone because of this COVID pandemic. And though things have begun to open up, we're still nowhere close to back to normal. Uh, many of us are still waiting to hear what is going to happen with our kids' school uh, or our own school if we're in college uh, or, or a student. Um, are, the, are we going back? Or are we not going back? Are we doing this part-time thing? Some of us are waiting to hear about our work for this fall. Uh, some of us are trying to figure out when we can visit loved ones again, high-risk loved ones. Some of us have elderly parents we haven't been able to see for months. This has been a really hard, frustrating, dislocating season. And yet, at the same time, uh, being forced to slow down, to step out of those regular rhythms of life that just can so dominate our world, also gives us a unique opportunity to examine and reevaluate our priorities in life. It's only when you slow down that you're ever able to actually think about some of those things, right? And so, you know, to what extent have we been devoting our time or energy or emotional uh, energy to things that, that maybe are receiving more emphasis than they ought? Meanwhile, what truly matters most goes neglected. As frustrating as all of this is, it's also a good opportunity and so before we attempt to just go back to normal uh, on the other side of this, our desire is to make the most of the opportunity that God is giving us to realign our lives with Him and His kingdom. Um, to think through over the next few weeks like what really matters most in different aspects of life, in you know, heart or home or church or work or world, so that our lives can be recalibrated to God and His kingdom. That's what we're going to spend the next few weeks on. So how do we know if we are in need of that kind of recalibration? How do we know? Well, when an instrument that we use to measure something starts giving bad information, like a clock that's a few minutes off or a scale that's a few pounds off, it needs to be recalibrated. It needs to be reset to the proper standard. So uh, in our home, if you've ever played Nintendo Wii, you always have to put the controller, you know, face down before the next level or whatever so that it can be calibrated so that, you know, when you go to bowl the ball this way, it doesn't end up going off that way or something because the instrument's not calibrated correctly. Or, or you think of a, an instrument panel in an aircraft you know, uh, which is a little bit dangerous to use an illustration like that with so many Collins employees to correct me. Uh, but, you know, when you discover your watch is a few minutes off, that's not that big a deal at the end of the day. But if you discover your altimeter, which is the instrument that tells you your altitude, is a few hundred feet off, that could be a difference between life and death. I mean, if you're depending on that instrument to land your plane and it's telling you you're 300 feet higher than you actually are, that's a rough landing that you're in for. And so that instrument must be properly calibrated to the correct standard. And so the first question for us to ask, how does my inner moral and spiritual compass line up with the reality of God and His kingdom. The way that I'm living my life, how does my life compare to what God has accomplished and called me to through His gospel? Now, we just finished going through the book of Judges. So the reality is that question, we, we know we've got our work cut out for us. We have seen very recently what the sinful human heart 
is capable of. Uh, and it was not pretty, right? Uh, forgetting the Lord and His saving work, everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. We've also seen the disaster that comes from living that way. And, and, and you know, the fact that God wants something so much better for us. But, but how do I know whether I'm moving in the right direction or not? That our navigation equipment's working properly. Well, you run some diagnostic tests. That's what you do with any sort of instrument to see if it's working. You, you run some diagnostics. And I would submit to you that this long, frustrating season of COVID has in many ways been a very substantial diagnostic test for our spiritual health. A stress test of sorts. You know, when you put something under stress, you reveal its quality how it's really, what's really inside. You think of, you know, putting weight on a bridge or, or putting gold through fire. Or if you've been to the doctor and had to do a, a physical stress test, you're putting stress on your heart through exercise to test its quality, to see how healthy it is. Are there any areas of concern or imperfections? That, I think, is part of what the Lord has been doing through this COVID season over the last four months, putting stress on his people to reveal what's really inside. And honestly, it hasn't always been pretty, right? Especially if the dumpster fire called social media is any indication, we're not handling this that well, right? It's a, it's a mess in our country, our culture, and even our churches. But of course, we can't just stand there and point fingers at how everybody else is handling it. The real question is, how am I doing? How am I doing with all of this? And, and so that's one of the questions I've been trying to ask myself recently. How am I processing this season? How is it affecting me? Uh, what's it revealing? How is it affecting me, not just you know, financially or physically, which some of us have had to navigate, but how is it affecting me spiritually and emotionally. And here's what I've observed, at least in my own heart. I'm tired. Like that's the number one response I find myself giving to people when they ask, how are you doing with all this? I'm tired. I'm emotionally exhausted. I'm tired of making decisions. I'm tired of having to rethink those decisions two days later. I'm tired of not knowing what's going to happen, not being able to plan and knowing that whatever I do plan, it's not going to be good enough. I'm tired of feeling stuck, tired of wearing a mask, I'm tired of not feeling in control. I'm tired. That's, that's the number one way my heart has been responding. And I would guess there's a few of you who could probably relate to that, Right? Uh, but I think it's also worth asking the question yourself. How are you personally doing? How are you really doing with this right now? What is, how is this season affecting you? What is it revealing? Uh, some of us are more edgy than usual, right? Like we're just so worn down by this whole thing that it, 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 it takes almost nothing to trigger us. We're just... Uh, we find ourselves snapping at others. We're arguing over everything. Uh, some of us are really discouraged. There's a sadness or, or a melancholy that's just kind of slowly seeped in over the last few months as we've grieved the loss of life as we know it, as we uh, struggle with lingering uncertainties, as we kind of feel trapped. We're just, we're sad. Uh, some of us are really scared. We're scared of being infected. We're, we're scared of loved ones getting infected. We're scared of accidentally infecting somebody else and not knowing it. We're scared of what the shutdown's going to do to our finances or to our education or to our friendships or our marriage or to our mental health. Some of us feel guilty. We have said for years if I just had more time, I would do this, that, or the other, and now here we are, and we're still not doing it, <laughs> and we feel like we've wasted something. Uh, some of us feel numb. We're just done. 
we're so done with all of this. I, you know, I can't look at another statistic. I'm not reading any more reports. I just, I don't have the capacity to keep caring. Um, and some of us are angry, right? We're angry. Angry that so many lives have been lost. Angry at the inconsistencies of, of politicians and health departments. Angry at the effect this has had on the economy. Angry at people who won't wear masks. Angry at people who are angry at people who won't wear masks. We're just angry, right? And, and for some of us, all of these reactions kind of converge into a, a vicious cocktail that has got us into a constant panic mode. Like the whole world spir- spiraling out of control and we feel like it's on us to somehow hold it all together. And so we are obsessing over every new statistic, you know, pouring over every news story, fretting about the lack of information, agonizing over every decision, clinging to the one voice that we think makes sense of it all, and then filtering everything else and everyone else through a, a lens of suspicion or even demonization as though the entire world is hanging in the balance. And if there's one word that I think could maybe sum up all of those different reactions, it's the word anxious. We are anxious, right? Unsettled, uncertain, on edge. And on the one hand, that's to be completely expected in an unprecedented situation like this. Like if we weren't concerned in some way, something would be wrong. But anxiety or worry is really an over-concern. It's an over-concern, or as Tim Lane puts it, it's an over-concern about something other than the kingdom of God. And that over-concern is, is not typically created by hard situations, but simply exposed by them. In other words, all of these reactions that are flowing out of my heart right now come from what was already in there. COVID is simply the stress test that revealed it, the diagnostic that that shows me that my navigation equipment, how I'm living life, is off kilter. And so what is the nature of our anxiety? What are we really dealing with here? Where does it come from? Like, what's the source of it? What fuels it? And, and what's the alternative? What's the alternative? What does God call us to instead? So the nature, the source, and the alternative. That's what I, those are the three questions I want to think about together as we look at Matthew 6, 25 to 34, which is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And the first thing that our passage helps us understand is that what's really going on with all this anxiety that we feel, all of this unsettledness in its various forms, is that we are caught between competing kingdoms. We're caught between competing kingdoms. We, we tend to think that, that our problem is situational. Like we just need to find a way to address the circumstances. What we're going to see, what we really have according to Jesus, is a worship problem. A worship problem. Our hearts are anxious because we're torn between competing kingdoms. So what does that mean? Well, the whole Sermon on the Mount, which is one of the most uh, famous parts of Matthew's gospel from chapters 5 through 7, the whole sermon is all about the kingdom of God. Or more specifically, in that sermon, what we find is a picture of what life looks like as part of God's family, as members of his kingdom. So what it means to live under the reign and rule of Jesus our King with humility and and loyal, joyful submission to Christ. And so it's this picture of the kingdom, right? But God's kingdom is not the only one vying for our loyalty and devotion. We're surrounded by all sorts of kingdoms that put their demands on us. All of the strain that we're feeling uh, that creates all of this angst and edginess, it's all tied to different obligations or expectations or demands or, or dreams of all of these other 
kingdoms. And COVID comes in here and just messes the whole thing up, right? A kingdom of work. COVID is ruining my career. Or the kingdom of recreation. COVID stole my vacation this summer. The kingdom of family. We're all sick of each other. Or we can't see the people we want to see. The kingdom of education. COVID's throwing off my plan, my pattern. The kingdom of self. COVID has revealed the fact that I'm not as in control as I think I should be or, or deserve to be, and I don't like that, right? But look at what Jesus says just before our passage in verse 24. He says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or God and career, or God and family, or God and ministry, or education, or recreation, or any number of things. There can be only one king in our lives. Only one supreme object of our devotion and allegiance. And only God deserves to be that king. Only God. He is the one who made us to be his children and servants of his kingdom. That's what we were made for. He's the one who holds this entire universe together, upheld by the word of his power. He alone is righteous and holy, actually worthy of absolute glory. And he's the only one powerful enough to actually rule the world, wise enough to know how to do it, and good enough to do it with love and mercy. Only God. And he's proven all of that to us by sending and exalting his son to his throne. So only God deserves to be the center of our lives. But when we forget that or ignore it, and therefore we attempt to serve multiple masters at the same time, it's then that we find ourselves in that all too familiar whirlwind of anxiety. In fact, this is exactly how Jesus describes what it's like when you try to serve more than one master. If you look at what he says following verse 24, he says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. And then he says it again in verse 31, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? And in case you missed it the first two times, he says it again in verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. There is an inverse relationship between trusting God and living with anxiety over life. The more I trust and serve God, the less anxious I will be. The less I trust God the more anxious I'll become. And, and so what all of this anxiety that COVID has exposed, what it really is, is a divided loyalty. My heart is torn between competing kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of all of these other things that I'm afraid I'm going to lose. Anxiety, and, and, and again, that's not to say that we should just be stoic and unaffected by all that's happened. We should be concerned. But anxiety is not the same thing as concern. It's an over-concern with something other than the kingdom of God. An over-concern that's caused by a divided loyalty. And so, how did we get there? Like, what, what, what is it that fuels all of this? Well, if we look again at our passage... Uh, at the precise reasons that Jesus gives for not being anxious, uh, especially in verses 25 to 32, uh, what we find are the roots of our divided loyalty. And there's three specific things. First, we're tempted to divide our loyalty between God and something else when we have a narrow view of life. 
when we have a narrow view of life. Verse 25 again. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? It's a narrow view of life. And, and this is the kind of verse you want to break out in the morning when you're trying to get kids ready for school and one of them is arguing about the shirt they want to wear because it's dirty and it's in the laundry and the other one won't finish their breakfast. And, and, and so you just want to say, you know, is not life more than food and clothing? Like, can't we just do this together, right? Will it really kill you to take three more bites or, or wear something differently? But that's so much easier said than done, Right? Because it is so easy to convince ourselves that life is, does in fact consist in clothing or a job or our retirement or our education or any other number of things that we fret losing or just losing control of. That life and liberty will be void if someone asks me to wear a mask. Or that life as we know it will cease if we actually go back to school in person. Or that my life will, will no longer count for anything if I don't get that promotion. That is a narrow view of life. Is not life more than those things? And, and when we do that, what happens is that we put the weight of our satisfaction and security and significance on something that is unable to bear that load. So we either, uh, we either kind of slip into this view where we're reducing God's kingdom to some pathetic shell of itself, or we're trying to serve God's kingdom and some other kingdom, either way the result is that we live our lives in anxiety and frustration. Anxiety and frustration when we have a narrow view of life. The second way that we're tempted to divide our loyalty is when we have a big view of ourselves. A big view of ourselves. That is when we take upon ourselves uh, things that we cannot actually control or accomplish. But we take that responsibility anyway. We rely on our own strength or our own effort or ingenuity to, to try and calm the storm or control the outcome of our lives. But here's a little cold water for our egos in verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious can add a single hour to the span of his life. Think about that. We are desperately running a rat race trying to do all of these things, and yet we are utterly incapable of adding even a single hour to our lives out of our own effort or ingenuity. We're not really in control. Of course, some of us don't really believe that, right? We, we're convinced that we're the only ones who know how to get us out of this mess. And so we live life with the caps lock on. We're always outraged. We're always anxious, trying to convince everybody. You know, if you would just, if everyone would just read this article or, or watch this YouTube video, and then we could all agree with me and save the world together, right? That's how we think it should work. And because people don't do that, we get alarmed or we get anxious and and. and but which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your life? We're not in control. We're just not. For all of our anxiety, we are pathetically powerless or pitifully powerless. And therefore, we're utterly foolish in trying to convince God to share his throne with us because we know how to do this, right? Right? We have a big view of ourselves. We need to beware of that, right? So a small view, or a narrow view of life and a big view of self, but ultimately both of those come from a small view of God. A narrow view of life and a big view of self comes ultimately from a small view of God. And that's the third and ultimate reason that we try to divide our loyalties and find ourselves stuck in this anxious rat race we see it in verses 26 and then 28 to 30. So verse 26, Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
I mean, if God cares about the birds, if he has the power to feed the birds, we don't plant anything or grow anything or anything like that. Will he not care for you, who his children made in his image? It's Jesus' point there, and he, he gives the same logic to clothing in verse 28. Are you, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And there, there he puts his finger on it, right? It's a little faith faith. We have a small view of God, a God who is either too distant to care, too distracted to notice, or too weak to do anything about it. And so he needs us to help him do his job. It's a small view of God. Little faith in a big God, as though COVID and everything that's come from it caught him off guard. But a big God he is. A big God he is. A God that we can trust with our whole hearts, with an undivided loyalty. And that's the alternative that Jesus points us to. In verse 33, the alternative to our anxiety is to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Again, verse 31, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The alternative to anxiety is not simply chilling out or, or caring less or becoming lazy, or something like that. Nor is God asking us, what you, you just got to find a way to balance all of those competing loyalties. Now, what He's asking us to do is to give our supreme loyalty to Him, and to bring everything under His rule in our lives, to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and see that the rest of all of this stuff will fall into place. So what does it mean to seek first his kingdom? It means very simply, seek to live under the authority of Jesus our King. Seek to live under the authority of Jesus our King. Trust him in all that he promises and follow him in all that he commands. It means that, that his priorities become our priorities, that the purpose of our life is folded into the purpose of His kingdom. It means that uh, we emphasize what He emphasizes, that our lives are, are about making disciples for the sake of His glory, that, that we forsake all other kingdoms and glories for His kingdom and glory, and that whatever interaction we have with these other kingdoms, we have as ambassadors and representatives of the true kingdom of God. So it doesn't mean hitting the eject button on the world or pulling out of this world for some sort of cloistered life. Sometimes people will misread the, the Sermon on the Mount to mean that. That's not what it's saying. It means living out our days in this fallen world as representatives of God's kingdom in full dependence on Christ. A kingdom that God has established through His Son in His life, death, and resurrection. A kingdom that we become part of through faith in that Son as we're united with Him. And when we seek His kingdom first, we find that several things happen. Sinclair Ferguson describes two of them. He says, first, we find that all that we need, He will provide. He has never failed one of His children. All of this clamoring over food and clothing, over education and public policy, God has it covered. 
He is a big God, right? So that's the first thing. Second, we find that many of the things that we thought we needed, we discover that we did not really need and now don't actually even want. At last, in the place of anxiety, we find contentment. Contentment in God, in His control, His provision. But I think we can add a third, too. When we seek God's kingdom first, we also find the perspective we need to recalibrate our lives with Him at the center. And so again, that's what we're going to be focusing on the next few weeks. Zeroing in on different aspects of life and and asking, all right, what matters most here in terms of my life revolving around God? Next week, we're going to talk about our heart, our personal life. Um, What matters most in our personal lives? After that, we're going to look at a God-centered home and and then church and then work and then eventually the world as we think about our interactions with those around us, we want God to be the center of that and we want to make the most of this season to see where we need to be recalibrated in each, in each place. But, but there's a principle I want to leave you with uh, this morning as we close. What we might call a, a rhythm of recalibration that helps us keep God at the center of our lives. So in seeking God's kingdom... It is utterly imperative that we keep first things first. And by that I mean time with God in His Word and prayer. I mean, you you can say a lot of different things about nurturing a God-centered life, but the foundation of all of it is communing with God in His Word, listening to Him in the Scriptures, and speaking to Him in prayer. If you try and do it with any other foundation, it will fall apart. So, you think of the story of Martha and Mary in Luke 10. Luke 10, 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. A woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled with many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, Serving Christ is good, right? It's great. It's, it's one of the best things we can do. And the church has work to do. But it's not the first thing. It's not the first thing. There's so much that we need to do. COVID or no COVID. The rat race was here long before the pandemic hit. There's so much that we need to do. Good things. But notice... How Luke describes Martha. He says she was distracted with much serving. She was anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing was necessary. And Mary chose that one thing, sitting at her Lord's feet. We are surrounded by so many voices right now, so many opinions. One voice matters. And there is no way to keep a kingdom perspective without spending time with the king. It is impossible. And the main way we do that is through the word and prayer. Listening to God in the scriptures and speaking to him in prayer. And I personally find that there is a very direct correlation between the extent of my anxiety and self-dependence and the quality of my time with the Lord. Like, it is so painfully obvious. When I'm not sitting at Jesus' feet consistently, it shows itself. I am so easily distracted by everything that I need to get done, everything that's going on in the world around me. I become anxious and troubled about many things. 
But one thing matters most as the cornerstone of a God-centered life. If I'm going to seek first God's kingdom, if I am going to live under the authority of Jesus, my king, not dividing my loyalty with this world and fretting about all of these other things, but walking by faith as a servant of the kingdom in whatever circumstances I find. If I'm going to do that, it will not happen without making this book a priority. For all of the voices we're listening to, this must be the one by which we evaluate everything else. And and not just listening to it academically, not just gaining information, but communing with the Lord in His Word and prayer. My personal life, my family life, my church life, listening to God in the Scriptures, speaking with Him in prayer. A God-centered life means that that we build our lives around God and His kingdom rather than around the worries of every single day. And my prayer over the next several weeks is that God would be pleased to refine us, to use this season that we did not invite or, or ask for, but here we are. May God use it to help us truly recalibrate to His kingdom, to His glory. That's my prayer. And let's pray and ask God to do it. Let's pray together. Jesus, we need you so much. And Lord, we praise you that that you have revealed yourself to us, that you are on your throne, Lord. Lord, how easy it is for us to forget that. And we confess there's so much going on, and it does, it throws us off, it wears us down. But Lord, keep us from dividing our loyalty between your kingdom and other kingdoms. Lord, keep us fixed on you, depending on your Son, that we might not only be faithful servants to your kingdom, but that we might be a voice of hope in a cacophony of of chaos and, and distress. Lord, may we be your witnesses that your kingdom is the one that will reign forever, the only one that makes sense of all of this mess, the only one that offers lasting hope and new life. May we point, may, may our lives be anchored in and may we point others to Jesus our King. We ask it in His name. Amen.